Hello and welcome to Tech Report. On this episode, I'll show you how to configure a free BSD server to serve network boot images to PCs on your home LAN. I'll also show you how to install Windows 8 and Fedora Linux directly to a network image. The first question you're probably asking is just what is netbooting? Well, simply netbooting is the act of booting your PC off of a server on your local network. Netbooted PCs pull their entire operating system off the network, meaning they require zero local storage. So, why would you want to netboot your PC? Well, the number one reason is redundant disks for high availability and redundancy. Consider most storage servers. These computers will typically have a RAID array of disks in a configuration that can withstand one or more failures. Consider in a traditional PC with no redundancy. If your main hard disk fails, all your data is lost, meaning a huge hassle of having to reinstall your operating system and recover data from backups. Now, in the event of a RAID 5 or RAID 6 array, a single disk failure isn't a big deal. Simply replace the failed disk and rebuild the array, no data is lost, and no big downtime is incurred. Obviously, bringing complex RAID arrays to individual computers in your network is not practical, especially if you have multiple computers on your network. This is where the advantage of netbooting comes into play. If you netboot all of your PCs from a single server with redundancy and a RAID controller, a minimal hardware investment is required and redundancy for all the PCs on your network is provided. Another advantage of netbooting is thanks to a technology called ZFS Snapshots. What snapshots allow you to do is essentially take a quick snapshot of your hard drive at any given point in time. Any changes to your hard drive are written to a difference file, and in the event that you experience problems down the road, either because of a system configuration error or possibly a virus, you simply roll back to the latest snapshot and undo all the problem changes. It's simple, no reinstallation of your operating system required, and no hours of banging your head against the wall trying to find the problem. Now it's important to note that ZFS snapshots are only going to be available to you if you use a Unix release that actually supports ZFS. Solaris and FreeBSD are two very good options that come to mind. Linux does offer a similar ability with a technology called Copy on Write. However, that is outside of the scope of this presentation. There are certain other advantages to netbooting such as lower power consumption and the ease of multibooting as well. Now that you've decided that netbooting is for you, uh, it's time to start gathering the components that you'll need to build your netbooting system. In this example, I'm going to be using FreeBSD as the operating system on my server. I would highly recommend the use of several disks for your storage array and configuring them in a RAID configuration, either with a hardware RAID controller or using the ZFS file system built into FreeBSD. Further information about configuration of ZFS file systems can be found on the FreeBSD website. In addition to your storage server, you will also need a copy of your client operating system, such as Linux or Windows, that you will be installing to your network, as well as the latest uh, source code for IPXE, which is the bootloader that we will be using in this project. A general working knowledge of Unix systems and a fearless attitude when it comes to the command line is also beneficial. Go ahead and install FreeBSD on your storage server and go ahead and configure your disks in a redundant array using either a RAID controller or the ZFS file system. Once you have finished installing FreeBSD, you need to go ahead and create a ZFS volume to serve to your iSCSI clients. Create a volume with the following command, ZFS create dash V 10 G data slash volume, where 10G is the size of your volume in gigabytes, data is the name of your ZFS pool, and volume is the name of the volume that you will be creating. If you opted to not use ZFS and are instead running this, these commands on a Linux system, um, you can create an image file and serve it up as though it was a ZFS volume. Create an image file by entering dd if equals dev slash zero of equals path to your image file dot img. bs equals one megabyte, count equals 10,000, where count is the size in megabytes that you would like your image file to be. Next, you will need to install the iSCSI target service, which will provide the iSCSI protocol we will be using to boot the network clients. 
Um, I'm going to go over how to install iSCSI Target in FreeBSD. It is a little bit different using Ubuntu Linux or other Linux distributions. You should look it up for your own specific release if you're not using FreeBSD. So go ahead and cd to the user local ports net iSCSI target directory and then compile the service by typing make install. Once the installation is finished, you are going to need to create a, new a couple of new configuration files. cd to the configuration directory, which is slash user local etc iSCSI target and create the following files. iSCSI target.conf, auth.conf, and iSCSI target control.conf. You can download sample configuration files uh, from my website. The link for those is in the description in this video and on screen right now. Note that I am setting up iSCSI target to provide iSCSI services without authentication. If you want to use authentication uh, to make your clients authenticate before connecting to the iSCSI server, then you're going to have to do some research on your own uh, to look up how to do that. You will now need to change a few parameters in the iSCSI target.conf file, such as the portal DA1, which will be the IP address of your FreeBSD server, the netmask argument, which is the network address and subnet mask of your home LAN, and of course the LUN0 storage parameter, which will point to the ZFS volume or standalone image file that you created in the previous step. The final thing you want to do is enable the iSCSI target service by editing etc rc.conf and inserting the following line into the file. Now start the iSCSI service by typing I service iSCSI target start at the command line and take a look at the output for any errors. If the service started correctly then you can move on to the next step, installing client operating systems. In the next step, we will configure the IPXE bootloader, uh, which will be used to boot off the local iSCSI disk image. When booting from IPXE, you have one of two options you can use. You can flash IPXE to a USB drive and place the USB drive in your computer and set your computer BIOS to boot off the USB flash drive. IPXE will then load your operating system via iSCSI. The alternative option is to place IPXE on a TFTP server on your network, configure your LAN's DHCP server to pass the IPXE executable as a boot option, and then boot off the network card installed in your PC. Your net PC's network card will chain load IPXE, which in turn will chain load to the iSCSI boot image. The first option will be the easiest, especially if you are unfamiliar with configuring network devices. In either case, you will need to perform the next couple of steps on a Unix machine. If you don't have a Unix machine, you can use either a Linux Live CD or you can perform the commands directly on your storage server that you just finished setting up. First up, you're going to want to download the latest source of the IPXE firmware. Uh, you can download it from git.ipxe.org. The specific link is in the description and on screen right now. Extract the tar file, and this will create a directory called IPXE with all the source files inside it. Next, we need to create a simple script that will be embedded into the IPXE executable and allow our PC client to boot up automatically. Create a new file called script.ipxe and place the following text inside it. Now, you'll want to replace the IP address in that script with the static IP address of your own storage server. Enter the source directory by entering cd ipxe slash source. The next command you enter depends on whether you want to boot ipxe from a USB flash drive or from the network. If you are booting from a USB flash drive, enter the command make bin slash ipxe dot usb embed equals path to script dot ipxe. If you are chain loading ipxe from your BIOS's pxe bootloader, um, then you will want to enter make bin slash undionly.kpxe and again the embed equals path to your ipxe script. The build should take about one minute and afterwards you can copy the relevant file out of the ipxe directory uh, i.e. cp bin slash undionly.kpxe or cp bin slash ipxe.usb depending if you're using the usb boot image or the network boot image. At this point, if you are using USB to boot IPXE, you can DD the image file directly onto a USB flash drive by entering the command DD IF equals IPXE.USB OF equals DEV SDA, where DEV SDA is the absolute path to the device identifier of your USB flash drive. 
Alternatively, you can always flash the image to your USB flash drive using one of the many GUI uh, USB drive image writing utilities that are floating around on the internet. If you are loading IPXE from the network, then you will want to copy the undionly.kpxe file onto your TFTP server and set up your DHCP server to automatically provide that boot information to your clients. Configuring this is beyond the scope of this tutorial, but there are plenty of guides out there which will point you in the right direction. If you have followed the guide up to this point, you should finally be at the point where you can start installing operating systems directly to your network server. I will be demonstrating two different operating systems, Fedora Linux and Windows 8. Let's start with Windows. And the first thing that I want to mention is a little oddity that the Windows installer does while it's installing to an iSCSI drive. When installing to an iSCSI disk, Windows creates an absolute route to the server using the default gateway of your network. This occurs even if the iSCSI server and the Windows client are on, are on the same LAN. This is retarded, but it's the way Microsoft decided to implement the protocol. The end result is that Windows will send all iSCSI traffic to the default gateway and then expect the default gateway to reroute the traffic back to the iSCSI server. Many routers won't do this by default, so you will need to poke around in the settings of your router to enable this functionality. After you have configured your router to do this, you will need to set up your PC's BIOS to boot in the following order. First boot device, network if you are loading IPXE from the network, or USB if you are loading IPXE from a USB flash drive. Second boot device should be your optical drive, either DVD or CD. What should happen is when you turn on your PC, IPXE will load up, attempt to boot from the network boot image, find out it's a not an executable image, and then fail over to boot from DVD or CD. The one thing that IPXE will do is preserve the connection between your PC and the iSCSI server. When Windows loads up and uh, you get eventually to the device selection screen, your iSCSI disk should pop up as a valid installation location. Select your iSCSI disk, and then continue with the Windows installation as normal. Windows will reboot a couple of times during its installation, and uh, the first time it reboots, you should note that when uh, your PC reboots, IPXE will load up and then begin to boot Windows right off the network. If it doesn't do that, then you've got some issues and you'll probably have to do a little bit of troubleshooting. If you're a Linux aficionado, I'm also going to run through the installation of Fedora Linux to an iSCSI server as well. Fedora Linux is even easier to install than Windows, with the one catch that you cannot install Fedora 18, so you'll have to use the new Fedora 19 release or the older Fedora 17 release. You also can't install Fedora directly to an iSCSI device using the default live CD image. You will have to instead download the full DVD image, I think it's about 4 gigabytes from the Fedora website. The link to that is in the description and on screen. After you've launched the Fedora installer, select the All Storage Devices option near the bottom of the installation location screen. Enter the IP address of your iSCSI server and let Fedora detect your disk images. Select the appropriate one and allow the Fedora installation to proceed. After the installation is finished, you can reboot your PC, configure your BIOS to boot from your IPXE source, and wait while Fedora boots quite happily from the network onto your diskless PC. Congratulations, you are now running Fedora Linux on a computer without a hard disk. A couple of final notes, the first being that if you want to netboot in a production environment, you should be using a gigabit or higher speed network. 100 megabit is certainly not suitable for uh, providing an adequate desktop experience. It's also important to note that you can customize the IPXE script you created earlier to facilitate more advanced options like multi-booting. There are a couple of good tutorials online linked from the IPXE site that tell you how to do this. Finally, I have demonstrated in this video an installation of Windows 8 and Fedora Linux, but it is perfectly possible to install other operating systems, including Windows Vista, Windows 7, and Ubuntu Server to an iSCSI server. It's also possible to install other versions of Windows and Linux with a little bit more customization. Hopefully you have enjoyed this video and are now enjoying a newly net booted PC. More information can be found in the links at the end of the video. For Tech Report, this is Christopher reporting.